Okay, our next speaker uh, is Greg Ridd at the back, Todd Packett. Uh, Todd has been associated with us, with us almost from day one. He sells fixed ends of income security Center State Bank, his headquartered in Atlanta. He's a Georgia native with Mercer University. Uh, he has uh, developed a reputation as one of the best speakers uh, in banking. He does on, on speaks at a lot of those prestigious banking schools and also in the circuit at a lot of conventions and, and other things. And uh, we're fortunate to have him. Uh, help me welcome my good friend, Todd Patton. So I've got the challenge today of trying to make sense of this economy for you. So uh, we're going to slog through and see what we can determine on what direction we think we're headed. So as we look forward, let's kind of go through and let's start with the good news. That's always the best place to start, right? The first part of the year has been pretty disappointing. We started in the first quarter and second quarter. GDP growth averaged 1%. You know, the challenge has been that growth just hasn't picked up enough to kind of barrel our way back through the ceiling, this cloud that's kind of been hanging over us. We've been running roughly at about two and a quarter GDP growth uh, since uh, the Great Recession recovery started. But recovery actually started back in the summer of 2009. So we've been in what is deemed a growth mode, expanded economy for some time. So as Charlie alluded to, we do have what's considered the best economy probably in the world. As uh, Dallas Fed Governor uh, Mr. Fisher once said, we have the cleanest, dirty shirt. And so I don't know if that's a compliment or not. But as we go through, what we see is that the lower growth this first part of the year, 1% even below the projection where we've averaged, which has been subpar and around the low twos. But so far this year, if you look through, hopefully the people in the back can follow some of these slides. But this is the Atlanta Fed's forecast, and they have us running up here right now for the third quarter, which is close to about 3.5%. So we're seeing good economic momentum, and this follows the pattern we've been in most recently. If you kind of go back and you look through the last five years, the first quarter has been disappointing. Some of it's been weather related. Some of it's the post Christmas blues, we want to call it. But growth hasn't picked up. Second quarter gets a little bit better. And then third quarter really seems to pick up growth quite a bit. In the fourth quarter, we kind of start slowing back down again. So we enter this time, whether this is the same pattern repeating itself, or we're actually getting some pretty good momentum. One of the things that we are seeing, which is great if you look here, this is a measure of bank lending. So I work with community banks all across the country. I kind of get to see what they do. I, I, first of all, I will say, shameless plug for Mike, I do get to work with some of the banks and see you guys are very fortunate to have this bank and this group of bankers in this market. They're really good at what they do. And so as you look at it compare, I look at the extension of credit as kind of the oxygen of the economy, right? We can't expand or grow unless we've got option and credit extending, because that's allows projects, job creation, it spills over. And we can easily see back here, at the crisis point of 08, how bank lending just completely collapsed. I've been at a number of dinner parties with friends and people here today, those banks, they just stopped lending, right? It was that easy. Let me tell you a little secret. Banks stopped lending right here, because everything they did, the federal examiners, the bank regulators, hit them over the head. Right? They were so harsh on anything that the banks did that it was extremely punitive. I had to get tell the number of banks that I would visit, and they'd have a loan with some of the books three, four, five years, never missed a payment. Right? The examiners killed them to make them write off a million dollars of this loan because the current appraisal came back so low. Well, why did the current appraisal come back so low? Because the banks that the FDIC was closing. They would take all their assets, sell them for pennies on the dollar. Now the appraiser comes through. His nearest cop is only a distressed sale. He doesn't know what to value it at. So to protect himself, of course he's going to value it low. The examiner gets that, goes back to the bank and says, you need to write out part of this loan. A loan that's never missed a payment. So it really put a halt on economic growth in the engine. And, and I give the FSC a lot of criticism for that. They were a big part of the problem during this crisis. But what we're seeing now is a good extension of credit. We're moving back up to some really elevated levels. And it's really been consistent the last three or four years. Really kind of starting back the last fall of 2014, banks had active lending again. And that's where we see their really lost stability. But one of the things that stands out to me that's really odd is because of this lending and growth, if you go around and look, particularly I live in Atlanta, that we see building happening everywhere. 
in all the different markets I go to across the country, cranes are up, people are building, and it's been a rejuvenation of, it, of construction across the country. Um, you know, Atlanta's different, I had to always kind of remind myself, you know, we're interested, we've got two one billion dollar stadiums being built at the same time, right? On top of that, we've got the Georgia Department of Transportation doing their largest project ever in building this super highway road up 75. So at one point when you come in Atlanta, there'll be a whole separate side going down 75 south that's off the interstate that's elevated for pay. And so we've also got Porsche, Mercedes, a number of corporations that are moving their corporate head headquarters to Atlanta. So Atlanta is unique, but it's booming like crazy. And so the, a lot of this is a shared experience in a number of markets. And so if you looked on the surface of things that we see, the number of cranes in the sky, you would say 1% growth, how is that possible, right? It doesn't feel like it at all. And so we're really having to try to go through the, the numbers and figure out why we're not getting elevated growth when the perception is that the economy really is pretty strong. And overall, I think we're in a pretty good spot right now, but we've got some impediments that we're going to have to try to get around in order to keep this thing moving forward, okay? So let's talk about a few of those. As we kind of go back through jobs and payroll, we're here, you know, job creation is here. We had a really bad dip in May, which spooked the market, right? We've been averaging close to about 200,000 jobs a month. May came in at about 15,000, just randomly. So the market kind of freaked out. And so we had a good rebound here, but we're averaging over 200,000 jobs a month. And so the recovery has been a job-based recovery, that's what the Fed is telling us. If people remember back to probably about August of 2014, the White House came out and stated that all the jobs lost in the recovery have now been recaptured, right? Celebration, yeah, we did. Look how good we did. Everybody look at the fine print on contracts. Everybody, if they didn't tell you, it's because of population growth. We're still 15 million jobs behind, right? So we're still way behind. So we look at this jobs recovery. Well, on the surface, it looks really good here. But what we're actually seeing, if we compare this back over the years to other recoveries and jobs, we find out that this has been pretty poor and gives us some information maybe why growth hasn't lifted despite the visual that everything's moving in pretty aggressively. So here we look at just the number of jobs through here, but we actually look at as percentage of job growth, again, our population is larger. So 200,000 jobs created a month today is not as good as 200,000 jobs created a month in the 80s. So when we come back in and do it for percentage of overall job growth, we're kind of average through here. When we come back and we actually apply, and look at the overall job growth compared to the number of actually percent of people, and we look at the average monthly job growth from payroll that's weighted for population, you find out this has been one of our worst job recoveries that we've had. And you can see typically when we have a recession, this period here in red, where we've lost jobs, the pickup comes back. So historically speaking, when we have a recession, the worse the recession, the better the recovery, right? We get just beat all up and we come back firing going forward. And that's where this has been what we call they live to the new normal which has been the unusual circumstance we've been in. And we can see here this job recovery, how many more jobs we've lost. And we just call that this is the net gain compared to the net gain after all these other previous recessions. So that's the part of the challenge for the Fed. And it's kind of like they look like me, right? We're growing in all the wrong places too. On the job recovery, what we're actually seeing, the bulk of that job growth too, is happening on this lower end salary scale. If you look at most of the job creation, these higher end per salary jobs really haven't been growing that well. And so what we're seeing is, I was at the Fed, uh, Federal Reserve Building one night for the economists speaking, and they were talking about how they measure job creation. You know, when you look at the unemployment report, and they're telling you we've got unemployment right now at 4.8%. Well, the part that most people don't know, it's only 4.8% of people who actually want a job is calculated as unemployed. If you're not actively looking for work, then you're not counted as unemployed. And so as they go through these measures, one of the things they don't really can't tell is the number of people that have lost a job in the recession that are now re-employed, but they're re-employed at a much lower salary level than they were before. And so if you were here, and now you've got a job in here, ding, counts as a job, but yet economically we're behind. So that's been part of the struggle too, but the Fed is really focused on job creation. And so when we look at the makeup of the Fed and what we actually have, the Federal Reserve Board 
is made up of 12 regional. It's the central bank system of our government where all the banks are kind of have to clear their checks. It's the hub of the banking system, okay? So then there's something on the committee inside the Federal Reserve called the Federal Open Market Committee, the FOMC. Okay, and this is the rate setting policy for the country, okay? And it's headed by Janet Yellen, who's the chairman, prior to her was Bernanke, and then Greenspan. And the committee that sets the rate policy has fed governors through here that are permanent appointees. As you can see, we got two that still aren't been nominated. Congress can't agree on anything, much less approving somebody at the Fed governor level, right? So the other piece is the presidents of all the Fed regional boards here. And what they'll do is they'll rotate their vote. There's only one of these that gets a permanent vote, and that's the president of the New York Federal Reserve. And that's currently William Duffin. He stays on because of the length of ties of the financial institutions around the, the Wall Street area. So all these others were actually will rotate every year. And they'll have a term of what we call doves and hawks, okay? If you're deemed an economist and you're a dove, you believe in more stimulus, aiding the economy, supporting growth for longer. If you're deemed a hawk, all you're worried about is inflation, right? You're a product of the early 80s. Only thing you see is inflationary problems. So you want to remove stimulus as fast as you can. So if you look at here, Yellen is deemed a dove. The federal government board here is all doves. And this is what we had last year was dove, dove, one hawk, dove, and dove. Okay? But this year the committee has switched. Now, if you look before that rotating off, we've got three hawks on the committee now where the doves are coming off. So the committee that sets rate policy for us has decidedly turned more towards a, a, a Fed that would more likely willing to want to raise rates. And that's what they've been talking about for a really long time. And I find this quite humorous. This has to be how the Fed feels. I don't know why that's there. But here's the Fed, is the fireman. The economy's on fire. They're plugged in. They're throwing money at this as best they can, right? And the people on the side are screaming, look, just look at all that water we're wasting. Well, the Fed, when the economy crashed, the Fed and the federal government had to respond in some way. Let's take this off here. There we go. The Fed and company have response so we had the stimulus package, right? A lot of people were critical of what the federal government did, extending money out the TARP. Does anybody know how much money the federal government has lost on TARP, the, the equity they put in all the banks? Zero. Every single dollar has been paid plus profit. So we complain about the economy being bad. Do you have any idea how much worse it would have been had the bank failures really spilled over? That we would we even be talking about growth in the market today, right? So it was good policy. Now, some of the things like supporting the auto industry, have they repaid all their debt? No. That's an issue that's still struggling, okay? And they haven't repaid all their payments back. But the banking system was a good policy. All that money's been recouped. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, you know, which supports the housing market system, right? Provides liquidity to make mortgages and ability to resell. Now, the federal government supported them. How much of their money they got back from Fannie and Freddie? All plus about $200 billion. They pretty much own Fannie and Freddie whole right now. They're reaping all the profits and because the economy's been good, right? Profitability's been high and the federal government's taken all that back in. So the money the fiscal government, the federal government actually put forward, it's been a really good investment for them, okay? Now, the Fed has had to do a couple things. One of the emergency policies you do when you want the economy to grow, one of the first things historically the Fed does is lower interest rates, right? Because if you're not willing to borrow at 7%, you might be at 2 right? Because the ability to carry that debt, that mortgage payment, everything's lower. So it would stimulate economic activity. There's a lot of other things they do behind the scenes, like buying and selling us securities. And they've had to use a few new weapons this year with forward guidance, where they basically told the market and said, hey, rates will probably be down for this long, right? They're using their megaphone, which has been one of their best weapons. The other thing they had to do is something called quantitative easing. It's called QE. And QE's been a new policy that's been uh, highly criticized. Of you know, the Fed claims it's very beneficial. And in that situation, basically the federal government is issuing debt the central bank, the Federal Reserve, is buying it, right? It's lower rates, and they're trying to push people out of the bond market into riskier assets for a higher return. And so things like stocks and real estate and commodities and things tend to live in that scenario, and that's what the Fed was trying to accomplish. But there's a, there's a secondhand smoke of that which we'll talk about.
So, for the feds are trying to, they've been throwing dollars at everything they can to try to get the economy moving. But this has been a longer term problem in my mind than just what happened now. The, 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 the Great Recession was the trigger, but for interest rates, it's been a longer term trend. And this gets busy, but I want to point out a couple things here. If you look, this red line here is the 10 year treasury. Excuse me, this is the Fed Funds line, and the blue line is the 10 year treasury. What I want to focus on is the red line. So again, the Federal Reserve, the only, the Federal Reserve Market Committee, the only rate they control in the market is the Fed Funds rate. And that's the rate which banks can lend and borrow to each other. It's a market-based index that kind of controls. The Fed doesn't control prime, which is the lending rate most of you see. But banks typically set all their lending to prime at about 300 basis points above prime. So in theory, when the Fed lowers the Fed Funds rates, banks will match that rate cut so it lowers your ability to borrow. And so what's been happening here, if you look at the Fed funds, back in the 80s when rates got so high, the pattern has clearly been as the Fed has to then lower rates to stimulate the economy, okay? And then when they overstimulate it, inflation starts to happen. So the Fed responds by then raising rates to stop inflation. So we see here inflation really high. We hit finally hit recession, come down, inflation starts, rates go back up to stop that. Now recession starts happening again. So they start lowering rates. And so that up and down pattern that we have from the Fed, what stands out to me is look at the peak here where rates hit and look at the trough. The next peak is not as high as the previous peak. And the next valley is lower than the previous valley. And so here's a 30 year trend where every point where the Fed gets to keep lowering rates till finally we hit zero, Right? We fell lower on the point here. The Fed has not been able to build it to get interest rates back up in this year that are normalized. And so now that we can't get rates very high, the fact that they typically need to lower them three to four hundred basis points to get the economy going again, now we're down at zero. So the question gets, if we can't get them very high again and the next Fed happens, what does the Fed do? So that's what the Fed is really worried about. So here's one trick I want to tell you, you know where rates are going. One thing we figured out is interest rates. If you look at the height of the next Fed chairman, Volcker was 6'7", Greenspan 5'11", Bernanke 5'8", and Janet Yellen is 5 feet. So if we get Bilbo Baggins or Frodo and these little guys coming in next, we've got real things to worry about. So use that as your trick. Watch the next Fed chairman see how tall they are. But we've got to figure out how to change this here to get the Fed some room. And one of the things to look at here, if you look at the previous bottoms where rates are really flat and stay, this length of time has been really short. And look how long this has been here. Now, as Mike alluded to, the, you know, the iPhone's been only been around eight years. Other than our last rate increase in December, we didn't even have iPhones the last time the Fed hiked rates. That's how long it's been. Think how much the world has changed in that period of time. So it's been a, we're in a completely different place. I teach a class at uh, the banking school in, in Madison, University of Wisconsin. It's usually about 200 freshmen every year that come in, and it's usually a lot of the, the up-and-comers of banking that people are sending their, you know, employees to to go to the school. And I'll ask, how many of you actually ever worked in banking during a rate increase? And almost nobody raises their hand, right? They'll be like, I'm going to ask you in a second if you're happy about who you get to vote for for president. There'll be a few hands that will be raised, most likely. Okay, so you go through. So it's a really interesting market. So why now? Okay, we got a Fed that sets rate policy. They're turning over and they're saying, they're saying, hey, we want to raise rates. But we talked about growth hasn't been extremely strong. It looks good this quarter, but it's looked good other previous third quarters as well. So as we look at this cycle, why do they want to raise rates now? Well, the main reasons is right here is called NARU, okay? It's the non-accelerating inflation rate of unemployment. Okay, everybody together, the non-accelerating. So, what it actually is, it's the market theory from economists that they believe, the Fed, that if jobs get so strong, there's so low unemployment, that you will struggle, struggle to find good workers. And if you struggle to find good workers, now you've got to do things to get them in and or keep the people that you currently have that you want to keep. So what's the best way to do that? Raise wages, right? And so wages start going up. And so when we look at inflation, inflation is the most basic form is when there are more dollars chasing too few goods. 
In, in an auction, you got a lot of people wanting one thing, it will likely sell over its market value, right? Because everybody's got extra dollars to bid on that one item. And so the market, the Fed has been fearful that as job growth, that's why they focused on jobs, would get so strong and unemployment would get so low that wages start going up and then inflation happens, right? And historically speaking, the Fed's always been really scared of inflation. And if you look at this line, this chart here, which is really hard, it looks like my grandmother drew it by going down a bumpy dirt road. But it, this is this kind of fits their policy. This line here is inflation. So as the line goes up, that means inflation is increasing. This is unemployment. So you can start all the way back, for example, back in the 60s. Look at the black line. Inflation was, unemployment was around about 6 percent 7%. And as the Fed stimulated and unemployment started to fall, you saw inflation start to rise. Okay? In every one of these scenarios, go back here to the 70s. As unemployment was moving this way and falling, eventually inflation really started moving up. If you go back to where we are right now, the unemployment got near 10%. And unemployment's been falling all the way down to about 4.8. But look, the market from inflation has actually gone down. It's never had this upswing that the Fed has anticipated. So we're not seeing inflation in the market. And this is globalization. We can spend the hour just on that itself. But so this has been a kind of a head scratcher for the guys that set the rules and set great policy. They kind of don't know quite what's happening here. Okay? Here's some unique things. But one of their premise before, if you look at overall wage inflation here, is it always end up, its correlation to regular headline CPI inflation has been really strong. So that's why they're looking for that. Okay. You can't have any good economic presentation on Barney Five, right? So as we look through, so what is the Fed really most scared about, okay? Growth's not super great, right? We got a hawkish Fed now. They want to raise rates. They're telling us they want to raise rates. So why? They said we would say because once unemployment comes down, that inflation should be rising, but we just see that's not happening. But the Fed still said they want to raise rates. My opinion is much like Barney Five, right? How many bullets did Barney have? One, right? And that's if Andy gave it to him. So the Fed feels like Barney Five. We talked about this cycle, this 30-year trend of rates keep going down, and now we're at zero. And should the next bad happen, what does the Fed do? I think the Fed's trying to gain their munition pop, right? If they lift rates, it gives them the ability to lower it later if they need to. So the trick for the Fed is, can they accomplish that without the same time needing to use that munition, right? Can, will they hurt the economy by lifting rates? How high can they get them before the net bad starts to happen? The joke in economics is that Janet Yellen said this in her congressional testimony, earlier this year, because I thought about the length of this business cycle and how long it's been and how it's, it's a unique in that aspect. And one of the reasons that I think it's been this long is because the Fed's been handcuffed and hasn't been able to do what they wanted to do, which is start tightening all the way back in 12 and 13. Okay? So because they've been pretty much handcuffed, the economy's allowed the, the, the expansion and recovery has gotten long. And so the joke is that Yellen said in her congressional testimony, said, that no uh, economic recovery has died of old age, simply that it won't just die by itself. Well, the economic response was, yeah, because the Fed kills them all, right? It kills every economic recovery because they start lifting rates at some point, the cost of borrowing gets so high, business stop expanding, <coughs> they start laying employees off, and the economy goes the other way. So that's why we typically see this up and down in the, the economy, partly because the Fed overstimulates and gets kind of growing too fast so inflation starts and then raises rates too quickly that snuffs out all the growth that we have and results in a recession. So this is what the Fed's trying to balance this line. You can see here with the Fed, all the way back in 11 and 12, they've been telling us they want to raise rates and they haven't been able to do it. So that A is a net good thing. I think that's why we had the recovery link that we've had. And B, it makes me a lot less trusting of the Fed's ability to identify when the appropriate time is to lift rates. Okay? And you think about it, these people are brilliant, just not even brilliant economists, but brilliant people. Scholastic and academic background that's as impressive as anybody's. And they have teams of economists, the Ivy League grads underneath them, giving this information as well. And they can't seem to figure it out. And I think they've been really wrong. So, we'll give you some reasons we look at it. 
in a second of I do think they're going to continue to try to raise rates. I'm going to give you the reasons why I don't think they can get them very high. Okay? Part of the reason starts with this. Has anybody really looked at the Fed's dot plot? You know what that is? After their meeting, the FOMC meeting, they'll do it, and at the end of every quarter, the Fed governments will basically vote and they'll say where they think interest rates will be, the Fed funds target rate, where it will be going over the next two, three years. Okay? So this line here was where they were back in March. And they had rates going, the higher it goes, again, back to three and a half percent rates. At the June meeting right here, the projection actually came, they said they lowered what they think rates will get to in 17 and 18 as they go through the year. This pattern's been happening every quarter. They go through the Fed keeps telling us it's going to be this, and they come back and say that. So part of the problem has been right here. This line right here, that's the market's consensus. The market is saying, we don't think you need to raise rates, right? At least if you do very little. But because the Fed has been so steep here, and the market's got really don't trust what the Federal Reserve is doing, every time the Fed talks about raising rates, the market gets fearful. The market is chicken little, right? The sky is falling constantly. There's always something to be scared of. So when the Fed says, I'm going to lift rates, they hear that the Fed's going to overcook it quickly, and the con rates are going to go really up here. So the market starts backing up, stocks sell off, bonds back up, and this whole process starts that kind of starts eroding economic activity. And so it's really kept a lid on the Fed going to lift rates. That what the, the reaction is in the economy from actually raising rates, it's been kind of happening just by them talking raising rates because the market's responded because the variance between what the market perceives as appropriate and what the Fed is saying are so different from one each other. Okay? So that's been part of the problem. So, but we know the Fed hike, they're saying they're ready, it's coming, okay? So the Fed will try to start lifting rates. They, they say that September, next week, on Wednesday is another a meeting. They say, they call it a live meeting where it's possible to lift rates. I don't anticipate that they will, but they're saying they might. But they want to give at least another one in this year, which likely probably means December, okay? But if they start tightening, these are the reasons that I don't think they'll get back to what we call an equilibrium rate, okay? The equilibrium rate is the rate at which the Fed believe rates are kind of neutral. They're not aiming the economy for growth. They're not removing uh, potential growth out of the economy. Historically, that's been viewed as 4%, okay? Right now, the Fed has lowered it down closer to 3 and Yellen's even acknowledged it may be closer to 2 okay? So I agree more with that sentiment that rates can't get up three or 400 basis points in the economy bill with weather that. And here are some of the reasons why. One, from the federal debt perspective, you look at our debt here projected, you know, look at the amount. We're actually back now out of post-World War II. We have more federal government debt right now today than we've ever had, and projections are only for it to go up more. So the idea of carrying all this debt, well, to take this debt load for the fiscal responsibility, is just going to us too much weight, right? Interest expense become too big a part of our balance sheet. So the Fed, obviously, it is an independent entity from the federal government, but the, obviously they're very linked. They know they raise rates too much. The cost of debt to the federal government will remove fiscal spending because the discretionary spending will have to fall, which will actually run some of the economic growth. Okay? Here, the psyche on consumers. Now, this says look at when the Federal Reserve raises rates that pass a little stick of dime to banks. I'll completely disagree with that. Most banks, when I go on the institutions banks are looking at, help the banks figure out their interest rate risk. You deposit your money in the banks in the money markets, checking, CDs, and then the bank will actually take your funds and then they'll reinvest in another asset, either loans or bonds, and they'll make that spread. Well, the term of your, when you pull your money out and when a loan matures, right, have varying terms. And so the interest rate risk on that piece is something we have to help banks manage that risk. Okay, most banks today have positioned their balance sheets to profit should rates rise. And so the banks here, this will be a very long. It would be a very welcome addition if rates actually start going up for banks. Now for consumers, what we typically see is no, right? Mortgages can go up. Cost to buy a car goes up, credit card debt. And so I think the psyche, and I'm guilty of this. I remember when uh, 
gas prices around four dollars. I thought I'd rarely pay for three. I'd never see two again. Remember when a couple of summers ago, I pulled up to Costco and it was one ninety nine. I was like, this is unbelievable. I've never thought I'd pay gas this cheap again. About a month and a half later, I pulled up again and I looked, and it was about closer to two and a half. And the first first thought that popped in my head was like, wow, the gas is expensive. And I caught myself. Just how elastic my opinion was on that, how quickly my perception had changed where I was begging for three a few months earlier. Now I was complaining about two and a half. And so the millennial generation, as Charlie touched on, is the biggest part of the workforce. They've never seen a 7% mortgage, much less a five, right? So I think they're going to halt their spending much quicker than maybe what traditionally has happened because we've been embedded at, at this rate level for a long time. So right now, bankers view 2% as being a good bond rate. Historically speaking, would you ever bought a 2% bond? Never. And right now, they're like, yay, 2%. So, so growth has been trending down in general. As we look at that, part of that reason to me is demographics. We've got a unique thing at play. We've got the baby boomers here all set to retire. And you've got to go back almost 30 years before the next population boom is as high as the baby boomers retire. So most of you are like me, you'll like this stat. This recent study found out that a person in their 50s, compared to a person in their 20s, the person in their 50s at their job is 60% more productive than somebody in their 20s based on experience, right? So now we'll be losing this whole group of people that have potentially been spenders, now the savers in retirement. We're losing tons of skilled workforce, and we're waiting for all this to catch up, okay? So if you look at it in general, this, has been a, this is a global phenomenon. Up here, this is the growth birth rates back in 1970. Think of warm colors as a lot of growth. Think of this as the projection. This is what it was in 14. Think of all these cool colors, how all these areas have actually turned blue. Population growth is down in general. And this is particularly true looking at developed nations. Some of our, the, the countries that make up the bulk part of GDP, even China, which is you know, the highest population in the world, is actually been trending down since 2012. They're losing two and a half million people a year on the workforce. Their one child policy instituted in the late 1970s is finally coming back to bite them. So it's a downward trend. Of all the developed nations here, the US is the one here, zero growth, right here. The US is actually trending in population growth more so than most developed nations. Does anybody know why? Immigration. Immigration. And that's one of the reasons we've got to get this right, right? We, through the president's election, we've got to get our immigration policy right. It's aiding growth and economic recovery. So let's figure out a path that actually works for everybody. Of oh, a long-term trend, just to kind of highlight the things to think about. If you look here, look at uh, Japan. This is in 2015. They have about twice as many old people for every young person they have. And for every 10 working people, they have 6.4, 6 and a half people that are dependent upon them through some safety net, social security type system, right? If you look forward to 2050, you've almost got a one-to-one -one ratio, nine and a half dependents for every 10 working. And you've got three times the number of old people as you do young. Japan currently has a 400% debt to GDP ratio. It means they have four times the outstanding debt than they do in revenue on the country's growth with a really bad demographic profile, okay? China, we touched on. Right now, they have more young, 2.4 young for every 1.3 old, just under four dependents for every 10 working age. By 2050, it goes to seven dependents on every 10, and then you have twice as many old as the young. Give you a frame of reference of how the U.S. stacks up. Right now, we got about five dependents for every 10 working age, almost equal 2.2 old for 2.9 young, in 2050, we'll have 3.7 old to 2.9, and 6.6 .6 depends for every 10 working age. So while it's not the trend line we want, we look massively better than a lot of other countries from a demographic profile as we go forward. So it's something to spend a lot of time on. The presidential election, I love this slide. If Trump would be happy about winning everything plus the disapproval rating, which he is winning. So we had Charlie Cook uh, come through and uh, speak at our convention earlier this year. He's a political commentary. And I'll share something he said was really interesting to me. Because he was like, how did Trump get the nomination? And in his opinion, this is what happened. He came through. He said Trump had about 40% of the vote, okay, support. And historically what would happen is, is that the establishment, with the other 60% of the establishment all get behind one candidate, 
and that person would have been at the 60 would be at the 40. Well, the establishment this time likely would have backed Ted Cruz. But Ted Cruz, the people that just is the most liberal Harvard law professor will, will tell you he could be the smartest and brilliant person they ever met. They say he is off the chart smart. He said, but the problem was, and came through, he figured out in his mind when he joined the Senate, is that the next primary election winner on a Republican ticket would be considered a non-establishment guy. Somebody that was kind of outside the fray a little bit. And so in the last three or four years of the Senate, he's purposely tried to be that guy, right? He's just picked a fight whenever there was a chance to pick a fight. And so that's why all the Senate Republicans don't like him. So now here's a chance where he needs all the establishment to support him. At this point, he's already made everybody mad, so he can never get the 60% to support him. And he was, pun intended, he was trumped by the one guy that was viewed more anti-establishment than him. And that's how Trump got here. So, all right, I tell him to ask the question, and I don't care about either candidate or party, but is anybody here excited to vote for either one of these two individuals for president? Got one, two, three, four, five, six. So we got a few. So that's good. At least somebody's excited. But I think overwhelmingly, I was about 97.5% armed. You know, so it'll be interesting to see where we head from here. The one good thing both candidates have talked about some fiscal infrastructure spending, which would be a stimulating portion for the economy. So we'll see if they can pull that off. Globally, we still have a lot of challenges. Greece, Italy, the EU, you got Puerto Rico, it's in the Middle East. Puerto Rico, and they're defaulting on its debt. China is still is a big part of the problem. They have, they've had a massive recovery since 2008. It's been extremely debt fueled. From 2008 to 2013, the debt they created replicated our entire commercial banking system. I mean, 200 plus years of banking, they recreated that amount of debt in five years. So it'll be interesting to see what happens with China. Okay, this is one of my favorite pictures ever because so I think it's quite humorous. This is Christine Lagarde right here. She's head of the International Monetary Fund that advises the world and economic growth. And so obviously everybody's in looking at her on the joke. And here's Janet Yellen back over here, who obviously doesn't get whatever's going on in that moment, right? She looks out of it. So I think that's pretty funny. So a lot of people feel the Fed is that way. Part of the reason the Fed, most countries are lowering rates. It's Charlie Tufts, a number of central banks that are trying to ease and lower rates. When we're talking about raising our rates, that makes the U.S. dollar go higher, okay? That makes the value of the dollar currency trading upward. And so what that does, it acts like a rate increase. Because now that makes the goods that are made here more expensive for somebody else in another country to buy. So it slows manufacturing. It actually makes goods abroad cheaper. So everything we're bringing in is cheaper, so it lowers the inflation measures. So part of the reason inflation hasn't picked up is because the Fed keeps talking they want to lift rates, the dollar stays very elevated, and we can see here how quickly it went up in just a second. I'll show you, this is the oil production, which we're tied in. But if you look right here, look at the dollar, how much it got elevated through here. Historically speaking, the dollar and oil were conversed with each other, and right at the point where the dollar started appreciation, look at the price of oil, how much it came down. Normally that's been a net boom for us just because you look at the market as a whole, most people are consumers of gas than we had production. Over the last five years, the bulk of our job creators come out of the whole industry. So it hurt the economy as well. Here's the amount of debt that's been issued right now in negative interest rates. Right now, we have almost a quarter of all bond debt. Basically, for me, if you were going to Mike and want to make a loan, he would essentially be making you that loan Say you make a loan for $100, and he's making you that loan knowing you're only going to pay him back 98 and he's happy about it. That's not a long sustaining business for Mike, is it? But that's what's happening in the bond market around the world. The number of countries that are issuing debt at negative interest rates, right? They're actually investors are buying government bonds knowing they'll get back less money on the day it matures than when they actually, where they normally would take in income. So it's really turning an asset into a liability. So our whole financial system is kind of controlling us here. The Fed is trying to manipulate the market, and so we have a long list of reasons right here why the Fed says they're going to lift rates. They just can't get them up very high, okay? And part of that has to do with inflation. We touched on quantitative easing. Right here, here's where the Fed actually stimulated the economy. 
And the reason they did every one of these things here, which were big market manipulations, they did it because they said they're worried about inflation expectations. Or right now the Fed says they want to lift rates, but look, inflation is actually trending lower now than it was back here when they thought they needed stimulus policy. So this was bad enough to warrant all of this. Now this we're going to raise rates. There's kind of a disconnect. That's part of the reason the market's really confused about the federal government saying, and that was the wrong button. So historically speaking, inflation since our birth, one thing the Fed has is look, the stability of this line compared to back here, this is inflation. The Fed's done a good job of keeping inflation in check for the most part. Uh, with all the things that have happened, I don't think we're gonna have this period of it going crazy again. Okay, golfers in the room, right? When we think of golf, we think of that, that beautiful day, everything going together. But the thing we know about golf is to make it work, your drive, your irons, your short game, your putts all gotta work on the same day, right? So a lot of times the day that should be like this turns into that, right? It's hard to have a great game every time for everything to work all at the same time, right? If you're driving good, we're putting back, vice versa. So the economy is kind of like that. If you remember back to your Econ 101 class for GDP growth, we look at it. It was the C plus I plus G plus exports minus imports. Consumer spending, this is infrastructure investment spending and government spending, okay? Consumer spending has been good. We're consumers, which is about 70% of the economy, has been spending at about a 3.5% clip, enough for the economy to grow. We just got past the sequestration of the fiscal government. The federal government is spending more than they were. They're talking about doing more. The imports minus exports is hurt because the dollar's gone up. The piece that's really been missing right here is the I. Businesses have not been spending, which has been quite unusual. If you look here at the amount of investment, business investments over these other recoveries, Look how much investment this is looked at as a percentage of production going through. The current recovery has been extremely low. And so what has happened is it's really caused productivity to fall down. So hopefully you don't have any employees that look like this guy. So productivity is really important because it allows expansions to grow. It improves the wealth effect of the economy. We're just not getting much productivity. So part of the reason we're seeing all these corporations as business did the amount of borrowing from the corporate America has been extreme, right? They're issuing debt like crazy. The problem is it's not going for expansion in businesses and factories and new production and new technology. It's going into financial engineering. So as we look here, this is the amount of money that's been spent. The blue is net buybacks, where they're buying their stock. And this is the change in debt. So we can say they're issuing debt and it very highly correlated with how much of their own stock they're buying back. You also see that here too with dividend yields. This is the percentage of companies in the S&P 500 that pay dividends that the dividend yield is higher than the 10-year treasury. So, but not the fund manager. Why would I buy the 10-year treasury at a 175 when I can buy AT&T dividend at 5%? Right. So, stock companies know that so they're issuing debt and they're buying back their own shares to reduce the amount of shares outstanding, and they're paying high dividends. In average, it's typical, if you look back since the recovery began, Wall Street has paid back 85% of all earnings back in either stock buybacks or dividends, right? We talk about that wealth gap that's being created. This is contributing to that, okay? So if you look at the technology, the anxiety, the, the fear index of most people in the market, this is where people make the mistake, the common guys like us, the guys that don't get paid professionally to manage their portfolio. There seems to be this term here in the markets. And right here at this point, euphoria, that's where most people are jumping in, right? That's where the meadows are getting in, but that's where the whales are getting out, right? And so down here, most people ride this market back down, this panic, and they'll finally sell down here and say, I'm done with the stock market. I'm not doing anything else, right? I'm through with it. Well, that's when all the other guys are getting back in on the upswing. And so this has been a historical pattern of what happens. And George Soros pointed this out. He came out the other day, he showed this pattern that typically happens in a trading cycle. Things get built up too quick, there's a little market swoon, and then there's this long lag here where people only feel like things are going up. And at some point that cliff turns. And you look at this pattern back in, going back through the tech bubble, the, the dot bombs that we had. Here's that same pattern, a little swoon, lift up, and then the collapse behind it. We had it in this current crisis with the housing crisis in the market here. Housing was going up, it eventually hit that wall. 
So we look at where the stock market is right now. We've had this little swoon here, well, this long leg up, and we haven't had this yet. Okay? So people wonder about stock market value. It feels like on most measurements the market is rich, and I'll tell you why. As we look here, this is the measurement of margin debt. This is the amount of money being borrowed to buy stocks. So look at the height of where we are here. We've got more debt pumping stock purchases and prices than we did in 2000 and 2007. The, the dot bomb crash and the Great Recession. Okay? We look at it from an earnings perspective. The valuation is up here from a P ratio. We've only had a couple periods that were higher. One is right here right before uh, the Great Depression and right here in the um, for the dot bomb crisis. And the valuation is above the regression line. So we look over value. And lastly here, this is a Buffett indicator. It looks at the current value of all the stock market compared to the overall GDP. And again, we're on a higher value measurement than we've historically been. Okay? And all this would make sense if corporate earnings were good. But what we actually have here is a period now of corporate earnings. We've got five straight quarters where corporate earnings have been down, which is a bit unusual. Historically speaking, what we've seen from a measurement is whenever we see the S&P 500 companies, their margin gets squeezed by 60 basis points. And that happens from earnings recession and back-to-back -back earnings quarters. There's been an extremely high probability. There's been a one example of us not finding a recession after that. As you look through here, and right now here again, we're experiencing that same margin compression. And we not only had just two earnings quarters, now we have five quarters in a row of that. So it's something that I view is, is something that's fearful in the economy now. Because what will happen if, if corporations keep struggling for earnings, what will they eventually do? They'll stop hiring, right? They'll, they'll start letting people go. They'll try to get their margin back in some way. And that's where the economy. So the fair thing about lifting, when we've got some monikers like this, is a little bit fearful in my mind, okay? Make a mistake. But the Fed says they're going to lift rates. We know they're going to drive them up higher, right? Well, the one thing to consider, and this is a couple of things from a longer term view, in the near term, I absolutely, absolutely believe the Fed is going to try to lift rates. But where are we from a longer range perspective? This is the number of countries that banks and social banks have tried to lift rates since the Great Recession. In every example we once tried, they've actually gotten rates up, and they eventually very quickly behind that have ended up lowering rates again because the, the economy couldn't afford to handle that slight uptick in rates. So the economy drove back down again. Said the lower rates were below where they even started. Okay, and this is a guy that Mike and I both like a lot. It's a guy named Lacey Hunt. He's, he's written for the Wall Street Journal last year as the one firm, Boisington Management, that has been most right about the rates going forward for some time. And if you listen to Mr. Hunt speak, he's an older guy. Real deep voice. He probably sounds talks like this. Everything sounds really, really bad, right? And a lot of his message is not too rosy. But for an example, one of the things you look here, this we know that this great recession that we have right now has been uh, deemed a debt-led recession. That means a collateral-based lending system, Charlie and Stanley got there, if you want a loan, they'll take your land historically, the moniker and banking has been, if you got dirt, you can't get hurt, right? Because land doesn't depreciate value. Well, and this is what we get all these loans at this land value at this, debt at this level, when all the value of real estate fell, now the amount of debt compared to the value of what was underneath it, right, was not the same. And so it's a really small, long grind to get that back up over a period of time. And so those kind of recessions have historically been the longest lasting, the hardest to recover from. Mr. Hunt went back and looked and found three examples in the last hundred years that had that. One was the Great Depression, one was the U.S. government in 1873. And then Japan was 1989. And each of those scenarios looked at at what point, at what point did the 10-year treasury get its low? And what you can't read right here, the study found that was 14 years later after the trigger event. So our trigger event was Lehman's collapse in 2008, right? That's what really got the ball rolling where everything kind of unspiral. So think about it, 2020 could potentially be the low in treasury rates. It's currently about a 175 as of this morning. Its historic low was about a 137. Right? So he's saying there's still too much debt, there's problems to work out. He's not believing that rates can really go up that much. Are there examples? Japan has been down, 
below, well below 2% since 1999. They've currently been trading at a slightly negative rate. Their 10-year treasury has been trading as low as negative 30 basis points. So, kind of hard to figure. I work our way through that. One thing you're seeing here, the problem in the U.S. recession, the 10-year the spread has moved in the bond market. The joke is that the bond market has predicted six of the last five recessions. So, they get a little excited every once in a while. But typically what happens, think about a yield curve. A yield curve is just a plot along. The three month will be the shorter out to a 30 year bond on the long end, right? If you were gonna lend somebody money, go let them borrow money for you, what has more risk? Lending it for three months or for 30 years? Well, obviously 30 years, right? So you would demand a higher rate to lend money for 30 years than you would for three months. And so that is reflected in the yield curve with low, shorter terms being lower in rate, longer terms being higher. So the spread is a lot of indication of what the market thinks rates are going. And so what's been happening now, since the Fed lifted rates last December, 25 basis points, you would think rates went up, the bond market would lift up too. But what happens, the longer part of the curve fell down because it goes back to the market beliefs that the Fed is killing this recovery if they keep raising rates. And so if you like looking at the market at all, watch the spread between like the one year and the 10 year treasury as it widens. It will show you suggest that the bond market thinks rates are going up and they're okay with that they feel like it's needed. If it's narrowing, that means the bond market believes something bad's likely to happen, especially if the Fed keeps lifting rates. So it's an easy way for you to kind of look at the market and get an idea of what they think is going on. So compare that margin spread, okay? So as we look at overall, we think the Fed here, growth is really slow. The rate hike is coming, the rate hike is coming sometime. And that's kind of what I feel like. The rate hike is coming. I believe it's likely to be really, really slow in the fact that they can't get them up too high too quickly. The economy is good growth right now. The Fed actually does this. I think we will have some continued growth going forward. But I am worried about the stock market and its valuation, right? We've seen some erosion in stocks in the last couple of days and have been a pretty bad. Part of the reason for that is you've got the Bank of Japan and the European Central Bank both back away from further easing. And so the market's dependent upon all the central bank stimulus to drive up prices. And now that they're fearful that maybe ending, stock values are starting to correct themselves. So that's something to be thankful of, mindful of. And we need at least one good football slot. So, uh, hey, wait, this feels deflated. I can ride the Fed. There probably will be struggle to get them up super, super high with inflation where they are. So, all right, as this guy, put these people to sleep. Hopefully, I didn't do that to you. Can we have any questions here? We've got about five minutes for questions. I know I didn't cover it here. Any questions? Mike. <laughs> My own dot plot. Remember, the dot plot is what the Fed uses to suggest how much rates are going. They've got rates by the end of 2018 being up near 3%, which make prime rate at 6%. Uh, I believe that the Fed may have 100 basis points with a lift. And I think at that point, the market will start pushing back pretty hard. And so I would put it closer to one and a half. Is what I think. Yes, sir. What do you think the true unemployment rate is when you factor in the 4.8 and the late participation rate? Yeah. There's been a lot of different theories on the question was, what's the true unemployment rate? We got a stated 4.8, and remember that's just measuring people who actually want a job, right? I remember back in the, in the summer of 2012, the second quarter of 2012, to give you an idea, in that whole quarter, the three months of the second quarter in 12, the market created 200,000 jobs. In just July that month, 250,000 people went on long-term disability with the federal government, right? So, we got a problem. Now, demographics of the retirees may be we're skewing that sum. If you factor all that in, it seems like we're more in that seven to eight percent unemployment rate right now, if you really look at the demand of labor and where we are. We're in an interesting spot. We're just now getting to the area where robotics are, at, are, a, are a true option to labor, right? Particularly manual labor. And that's been one of the great things about our economy for forever is 
is that you could live a good middle class life through brawn, right? So if you were a hard working guy through brawn, you could make a good middle class income. A lot of that's going away, right? It's becoming a lot more cerebral. Manufacturing things are getting tougher. And I think that's part of the reason we're having a erosion of the middle class. And now there's a skills shortage. So there's a lot of people that actually don't have the skills needed to get a job right now. Even though the actual number of job openings is about 6.1 million employers that they can't find people that's A, willing to work, or B, have the jobs necessary to do those jobs. So I think it's probably more than 7 8%. More questions? Uh, how many of the red long-term use of It's significant. Um, and I think you got to phrase that in comparison. Japan, like I said right now, has four times the debt that they do in revenue from the federal government overall, total indebtedness. Their federal government is about 200%. We're just about to breach 100% of debt compared to GDP. Right? Equal debt to GDP. We've got to get it. There's no, it's not a coincidence that our, part of our biggest boom we ever had was when the federal government was running surpluses and we were lowering the national debt under the Clinton and Republican Congress. Now, granted, it had a unique opportunity that people don't give no credit to is how the internet really kind of had its boom. And that helped fuel a lot, make that happen. But getting the debt down, the lack of indebtedness, would, would absolutely. Uh, to me, be a driving factor for long-term stability. That's why, for me, I tend to, to fall more on presidential issues. I tend to fall on the right side because the fiscal matters more important to me than the social. I figure we don't get our fiscal house in order, none of the social stuff's going to matter long-term. So it is a major concern, and if you look at the what's in front of us, it's going to be a growing concern, mildly, over the next few years. So if it's an equal concern to you, I would encourage you to support candidates that are willing to do something about it. Yes. How concerned are you, especially concerned that the actual unemployment rate are tied on the same of our costs? Yeah. It's extreme. I mean, it, you know, Atlas Stroke, you know, if you, you look at the world, there was, there was a quote I loved in an article about Greece after their financial collapse, right? And in the article, it basically said that, that politicians had the perfect plan. They would just keep giving back to people so they would vote for them, which was the perfect policy until they ran out of money. You know, and that kind of feels like the road we're on somewhat, is that we're, we're giving out a lot and people become dependent upon it. The trend line shows that job creation now is, is removing some of that. The New York Fed just said they're starting to see some better way jobs come through the cycle. So hopefully we're detaching ourselves from that. But through this cycle and what some of the candidates have said, and, and honestly, the, the support that Bernie Sanders got to me fueled that idea that the government should be giving more. And with this new millennial mindset that we all quite don't understand, uh, I feel like that's going to be a problem that continues to expand versus the trap. Any more questions? Well, I told Mike that you guys like what I had to say or agree with me. Uh, hopefully you understood it come from about 20 years of studying and reading and understanding the markets and trying to understand and advise clients. If you didn't like it, just remember I had a management degree. So, so. Thank you very much.